Hello everybody. I'm so happy that you are here today for Silver Maples is People, originally brought into existence by BBC, by Barbara here right in the front row. So thank you again, Barbara, for giving us the opportunity to get to know each other better. So thank you for being here today. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Linda Malash and I'm super honored that I get to interview all you good people from Silver Maples every now and again. Today is a special day for me too because the person I'm interviewing is a newer Silver Maples resident. Her name is Rita Dunlop and she is my mom. So, I hit the lottery when I got to have Rita Dunlop for my mom, so I'm super grateful for that. So we're gonna start out by we're just going to start out, Mom, by getting a little history from you. So could you start out by telling us if we could go all the way back to your parents. Okay. So Grandma and Grandpa Bella and, and, and Mom and Dad to you, or Mom and Pa, I think you called them. Mm -hmm. So if you could tell us the story of how they came from Malta to here to America. Okay. okay. Mom sure. is a first generation American. That was the first thing I was going to say. <laughs> I am a first generation American. Um, my parents were both born on the island of Malta. And for those that don't know, Malta is, um, well, it actually consists of three islands in the Mediterranean Sea. And it is, I think, 60 miles off the tip of Sicily. And my parents didn't meet in Malta. They both came here individually. My mother was only 12 when she came. And um, yeah, but to start with, my grandfather, Nanu, came first, probably around 1910, 1915. And because it was easier to get into Canada than in the US at the time, he um, went, was it Montreal? I think it was Montreal. Yeah, I think so. I have a couple of sisters here, that's why I'm trying to check. <laughs> to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, but yes, Nanu came over first, and I think a lot of the men did that so that they could earn money to pay for the rest of their family to come over and to set up a house and such. And so Nanu did that, and, and when Ford opened um, the Ford Motor Company. Okay, the plant. Right? The plant, yes. Nanu moved to Detroit, and that was where I was born and grew up in Corktown. Oh. Tell yes. us the story about Grandma Bella now leaving Malta. So Nanu, her father, mm -hmm. has settled now in Detroit and is ready to have the rest of his family yes. come over. So yeah. tell us who the rest of the family is and then the experience of your mom in leaving Malta. Okay, my mom had um, two sisters and a brother, the four of them, and she was 12 when they came over. Um, a long, difficult boat, you know, uh, coming across the ocean. A um, couple of funny stories that she told us. Well, first of all, leaving Malta was, of course, really hard for all of them. Um, my grandmother especially. Her name, Nana, and that's what my grandkids call me now too. Um, but when Nana, you know, she said goodbye, and in those days, it wasn't like, you know, we've got texting and, and all and flying back and forth. It was a, a long trip across, and she was with her three children, four children. Um, I think I said my mom was 12, she's the oldest. And um, on, the, on the way over, um, I don't know how long it took, kind of long though. I, I'm thinking like even a couple of weeks maybe, um, if not longer, yeah. Yeah, by boat, yeah. And what they did um, was at night, they would separate the men from the women. Um, for sleeping purposes, and my uncle Joe, um, my mother had the two sisters and Uncle Joe, 
and he was oh, I'm guessing eight, nine at the time, and did not want to go off by himself. Can't blame him. Um, so my grandmother, I thought this was really clever of her, dressed him like a little girl so that, so that he could be with, the, with them. Um, it didn't seem to affect Uncle Joe at all. And he was fine, but... Um, yeah, and another story that mom told was that um, one day they were playing on the ship and they found some coins. Um, and so they went around asking people if they had lost these. And one, it was in a purse. And one woman said that, um, that it was hers. And um, evidently it had there were papers in there that were important, but she took these three coins and gave them to the kids mm -hmm. to thank them for it. And of course they took them back to Nana and you know, oh my, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they were just shiny pennies. <laughs> um, they thought it was, you know, some big thing, but still kind of nice and it makes for a good story besides. I like how too Grandma Bella said that uh, they were so proud of their three pennies and when they got uh, to Nanu, to the, their dad, to, look what we got. He laughed and laughed and said, this is not much. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Well, in those days, when you came over, you stopped at Alice Island. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Um, I went there, have you? Yes, I went there once. Mom, they're asking oh, if you can. I'm sorry, there we is go. this better? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, when they uh, they went to Ellis Island and there was some kind of a mix up. My grandfather had moved into uh, from one place to another and they, they kind of lost communication there. And so um, my, my grandmother and the kids had to stay on Ellis Island a few days before he came and, and got them. Um, but then they moved into a house um, right in almost downtown Detroit. Um, it's where the um, Motor City Casino is. Um, 1607 Sixth Street. 1607 Sixth Street. Very good, Mary. Um, anyhow, and the house, no, they moved into the one next door. It's okay, let's keep going. Okay, okay. Um, but um, my, my grandparents, to make extra money, rented the upstairs floor of the house, and um, that's where my dad came in. My dad had come to America, and um, as they did, they would look for like a, a Maltese family, people who spoke the language and all. And they, um, my, grand, my dad roomed upstairs, and that was how he met my mother. And it also happens that my Uncle John also met my Aunt Mary the same way which was very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was the start of them being here in America. Wonderful. So we're gonna fast forward just a little bit because we don't have a whole lot of time. So let's fast forward a, a number of years. So you are in Detroit still, mm -hmm. uh, and grandma and grandpa have gotten married and they have had 10 children. <laughs> 10 children, five boys and five girls. Three of the girls are in the room with us right now. <laughs> so my mom and then her sister Mary and her sister Sylvia are right here in the room right now. So my question for you, mom, is from your memory growing up with 10, nine other siblings, so there were mm -hmm. 10 kids, and of course you had cousins and everybody on your street as well. This was at the sort of the tail end of the depression. So you were born in 1938. So coming toward sort of the mid to end of the depression. How do you remember, what are your memories of that many kids 
grandpa a painter, how did you guys get by? How did you always have enough food? Tell me about that experience. Yeah, I, I can remember one of the grandkids asking my mother, did you ever go hungry? And never. In fact, strange as it is, I mean, we didn't know we were poor. We were, but we didn't know it. Um, we ate a lot of soup. It seems like at least five times during the week, our dinner was soup. And lots of bread. And bread, yes, lots of bread, because Wonder Bread was like a block away from us. <laughs> and you could get, you could get, you know those cupcakes, two cupcakes in a package? I think it was three cents each to buy the two cupcakes. It was such a treat. But like you said, I had cousins all over. It was like a little Malta there. And that's what people did when they came to America. They settled in groups with their, their own people. And so there was always somebody to play with, some, you know, something to do with your cousins. Um, I don't know. I, I, do you remember a meal that grandma used to make frequently? <laughs> Other than soup. And there were, okay, taflia, manestra, um, in in Karoo, in which I understand my niece still makes. I think that's great. And it feeds a lot of people. Yeah, it's a macro, baked macaroni is what it is. Um, but yeah, that, we ate that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was strange that you said you never celebrated birthdays. <laughs> Just didn't do that. Never said a happy birthday. Uh, nothing. No celebration yeah. of birthdays. No, it wasn't part of our tradition. I mean, we noted Saints Days, Saint Rita's Day is in May. Um, and yeah, but with ten children, could you afford to celebrate? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, as we got older, as my older sisters, because I was number eight, I was one of the younger ones. Um, as the older sisters got jobs and such, then we would. I can remember, you know, some birthday parties. Sylvia, my younger sister, lucked out on that. She had birthday parties the whole bit. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I remember you, Mom, telling me about when you, because you were one of the younger um, daughters, and that sometimes your older sister, Mary, would include you in in some of the, when she was out with her friends. Yes, Mary, honestly, I so appreciate that. Mary introduced me to libraries, to a library, and I love libraries. Um, we, had, we had a beautiful library close by, and Mary and her girlfriends would go there often, and they let me tag along. Mary took me ice skating, something I would have never done. Oh, she was. She still is pretty nice. <laughs> Wonderful. And then uh, one of the stories that you tell about Aunt Sylvia, who was also here right next to Aunt Mary, um, is that you were, the, you were the youngest child for quite some time. Yes. And then Sylvia came along and ruined everything for exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Really. Yeah, I, um, okay, I, I was number eight. And then we went seven years with no other kids. But, you know, before this, it was one every year. Um, oops, okay, there. Um, I can tell it sounds better this way, yes. Um, so when Sylvia came along, oh, cute curls and blue eyes and the whole bit. Um, yes, I was very jealous of her. <laughs> You had also talked about the fact that one of your eyes crossed in at that mm -hmm. age, so you said you were no no beauty then, and so on. Oh, so you came along. Yes. But tell me the story how your eye being crossed in, one good thing, at least one good thing, came from yes. it. Can you tell us why? Yes. With 10 kids, you don't get one-on-one -on -one with your mom very often, hardly ever. But because I had this problem with my eyes, um, I had to go to Children's Hospital Clinic um, on a kind of regular basis. And um, I got to go with my mom, just the two of us, and we took two streetcars. Do any of you remember Detroit streetcars? Yeah, you know, not, they're not anymore, but we, and we would have to 
switch from one to another. But I loved this time because it was just me and my mom. And incidentally, when I had, I have four daughters. Linda is the second one. And, um, and there's another one sitting here too. Jennifer's my youngest daughter. Um, I tried to do that more often with them just because I was aware of the fact of how special that was. And I will say that this was a very special thing. I was just telling somebody the other day, actually I was telling a group of people, the question that I asked was, raise your hand if you can remember the first concert that you went to, live music. And anybody remember their first concert? All right, some of it goes back. Anyway, mine was Fleetwood Mac at High Knob, and I said the most special part about it was that I got to be there with just mom and dad because that was something that they did for us. And that was my special thing is that I got to go to the concert at Pine Knob to see a big rock group with my mom and dad. And I remember being thrilled about that. So mom, could you tell us about a time, the time when you accidentally almost burned the house down? <laughs> oh yeah, oh, very memorable. My dad, my dad at Christmas time, would make a multi del you know, a cookie that was made, it used to be made with figs in Malta, but here they were made with dates and they were deep fried. And we had a, a stove that had the deep fry well right in it. And um, I was helping my dad and I was alone in the kitchen working on them and I was done and I turned it off. Well, actually I thought I turned it off, but instead I turned it all the way up to high and left it. And at one point we discovered fire coming out of it. Yes. The kitchen stove that she's talking about was, we used the kitchen down in the basement the stove was isolated in the kitchen that nobody used. <laughs> yes, and um, so my dad, what he should have done was cover it, but he didn't, and he picked it up and carried it outside. The outside door was not too far from there. And of course, you know, yelling in Maltese all the way. And little Rita was just devastated. And I ran, I can remember one of my sisters was in the living room with a new boyfriend. And I can remember running by them, crying my eyes out. And my dad, he was, he wasn't like um, a gentle man. He was kind of harsh and, um, he, I can remember he came upstairs and comforted me after. And it was, again, memorable because that didn't happen often. It, it's, an, again, a really good memory of mine. Well, I love to hear that. So let's fast forward a little bit more now to your teen years and maybe later teen years when you met dad, my father, when you met dad for the first time. Mm -hmm. And a little bit about how grandma and grandpa were about dating and how they didn't really want any of their girls to date. And so it was a bit of a challenge. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, my dad, I mean, I felt sorry for any guy that came to our house because <laughs> my parents, my dad, didn't make it easy on us. The boys, they could do anything they wanted, but not us girls. Anyhow, um, I had gone, I was a senior in high school, and I had gone to um, a, a youth club, St. Gerard's Youth Club, like a sock hop. Some of us, I see some of you guys nodding. You remember sock hops we used to have. And uh, I had gone with a girlfriend, and it just happened, I didn't, it, well, Mort was there with a couple of his boyfriends, and I knew Mort is one. my dad, oh, so Mort. yes, my husband. my husband, yes. Um, and when I walked in, I saw him standing there, and I kind of, well, I, I knew I wanted to meet this guy. And um, so we did a, a mixer 
where the girls were in a circle in the middle and the guys were in a circle on the outside. Again, some heads nodding. That, that was done then. And the music played, girls went in one direction, the guys in the other. I had arranged with the um, chaperone. I told him when I wanted him to stop the music. <laughs> and he did. And the rest is history. <laughs> we kids did not hear this story until much later in life. And Jenny, do you remember being like, I was super impressed with mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Like, we didn't think of her as being that bold, you know, going out and saying, see that cute guy? Stop the music when I'm in front of that cute guy. Oh my goodness, that was that was a shocker for us. So, all right, so then, so then you and Dad dated. Do you remember, what were some of the places that you went when you dated? Um, wow, that's a good question. A lot of times it was just to go like to big boy, well, it wasn't big boys, but similar, that kind of thing. Oh, the old mill was a coffee place that we went to, um, to different people's houses, hung out. If dad came over um, at rosary time, what, what did you have to do with that? Yeah, my family said a family rosary every night. And um, Thank you, girls. if one of the guys happened to come at that time, he knelt down with us and said the rosary. <laughs> yep, it was done. Um, and Mort did it. I mean, you did if you wanted to be dating this <laughs> <laughs> So you and Dad got married, and you were how old? Much too young. Um, I was, I had just turned 21. And the same with Mort. We were both very young. Um, I did not go to college, um, and neither, neither did Mort. Um, he was in the, his grandfather had gotten him into the union, and he was an electrician. And um, so, yeah, we got married and, and moved into a little tiny house on Eight Mile Road. Um, our rent was $60 a month. <laughs> it was really nice. It was a darling little house, but it didn't even have a washer and dryer in it. There wasn't room for that. Um, so when I got pregnant with Laura, my first child, um, we moved to um, a little bigger house with two bedrooms. And um, you were just talking about that house. So what did you pay for that little house on Graydale? $12,900. Yeah, yeah. And it was an interesting house where the people that lived there before were really into purple. Well, lavender. <laughs> Honestly, the, everything in the house was lavender, except in the kitchen, and the cupboards were painted a bright yellow. Um, like I say, it was interesting. And even when we went to the closing for the house, uh, the couple was dressed all in purple. <laughs> it, was, it was really weird. I've never heard that. I didn't know that story. Yeah. Oh, isn't that funny? Oh, I love that. All right, so you had, uh, in pretty close succession, Laura, and then came me about a year and a half later, and then a couple later, a couple years later, Deb, and then a couple years after that, Jenny. So you had yourselves four little girls. Do you remember, and then at this point, you have now moved to Southfield to a bigger house, so mm -hmm. to a, a colonial that had four bedrooms. Do you remember what Dad's reaction was to having, when, when Jenny came along as a girl, the fourth girl in the family, do, did Dad say anything like, oh, man, or, or was he like thrilled, like, yay, girls are the best? He did say this later in life. I will I say that. In later in life, he was yes. thrilled that he had four daughters. But what did he think at the time? Did he, what was his attitude? Oh, Jennifer, I'm sorry, but no. He was, <laughs> he was sure the fourth one would be a boy. And no, he was, well, I mean, he wasn't like he was really upset. Um, and those little girls just won him over. But um, yep, at first it was not all that wonderful. <laughs> but I will say that he had, and many times later in life, 
You guys are probably aware that girls do a very good job of taking care of you, and you're, and you're I'm sure boys do too, but, but also girls are known for taking good care of some parents. <laughs> True. Um, I just think my husband is a, a son, and he's very good at taking care of his mother. My husband is right in the room, so I, I will say that publicly, honey. It's true. <laughs> But you're unique and wonderful. So, but girls, <laughs> girls are, are traditionally take good, good care of their parents. So, Dan has said many, many times how happy he was that he had four daughters. Um, so, I, I'm I'm grateful to hear that too. We're, we'll get to uh, in just a, we'll get to in just a little bit um, how Dan did get to live in Silver Maples for about a week. No, it was a couple, couple maybe weeks. even three weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll we'll get to that in, in, in just a little bit. Something that I forgot that you told me to ask you about, Mom, was Nanu, your grandpa, used to make a wine out of Oh yes. yes. No, 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 it was made out of figs. Oh god. Out okay. <laughs> Tell us about the that. The Maltese word for wine is imbeat. And so that was what we called okay. it. Imbeat. Um yeah, he made it in oh he had the great big, I mean, he made big batches at a time. Um, and he lived with us for a while, and he had made it um, on you know a regular basis. There was always a big jug of Nanus and Beet on the table at dinner time. And a memory of when I was real little, they would just, just for the effect, they would give me a little bit to taste to see this ugly look on my face. <laughs> it was very dry, and to this day, I like my wine a little bit more on the sweet side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. So here we are now, up to, up to the point where you've got four little girls, and Dad is an electrician and working, and you're a, a stay-at-home mom for a while. Mm -hmm. And then you began to, to, to take on various jobs. So was it as we kids got a little bit older? Sure. Yeah. All right. So yeah. what was what were some of the jobs? I mean, I know I can remember you once were an aide for a little boy with severe autism. You mm -hmm. once worked at a gynecological office. You once were a school secretary. So tell us about any of these jobs that you had as you were going along. What stood out for you? Okay. Um, Having four kids and me not working, uh, money was a little bit tight. And um, so when I could, when the, when the girls were a little bit older, I went um, to a bank close by and became a teller. Um, I enjoyed that, that was a lot of fun. Mostly I worked the, the I worked, um, I think it was Thursday and Friday night and then Saturday, a half a day. Um, and then after a while, there was a long period of time when my husband was laid off. And um, to, to help along, the government offered a program of sending you to school and learning whatever. And I went and got um, a degree in um, a registered medical assistant. And then I worked at a doctor's office. Um, oh, I just loved that job. I At first I was an assistant and then I managed the office. But um, my two very close friends that I worked with were both named Peggy. And um, like I say, they're still close friends, Peggy T and Peggy R. So if you can imagine, so mom's working for this gynecologist, and I'm sure working for a gynecologist, you're very comfortable in saying words that are not appropriate around a dinner table. <laughs> and she would come home from work, Jenny can attest to this, and she would talk about the various ailments that people came in with and would be like, Mom, stop talking about that. Don't say that word at the table. Oh my goodness. And did you know when you worked at the bank, my fear was, was that the bank would be robbed? Because you were the teller, and you know, you see that in movies and stuff, and I thought, oh no, you're not safe, but it all worked out just fine. The it worked out rough. fine. One day, um, on a Saturday, we, there were just a few tellers, there weren't very many, and I think it was just the drive-in window that was open, and I was um, the top teller at that time, the, the one that had been there the longest, I couldn't open the safe to get the money out. And um, 
oh, what a nightmare that is. I think I'd have rather been rocked. Oh, right? yeah. it's been, oh, it was bad. Finally, they did get someone in to, to open the safe. But um, yeah, I know that. And leaving at night sometimes, it was a little bit scary, but not bad. Okay. Yeah. For many years, you were a secretary in the Southfield Public School System. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I started out working in the superintendent's office, um, and that was, I believe, part-time. And then after that, I went to um, work in the this, this school itself, and I worked with um, disadvantaged children. Um, the group I was with were middle schoolers um, that were emotionally impaired. and. Um, Again, a job I just loved. Um, just met some of the sweetest kids. One little guy was so excited one day. Mrs. Dunlop, Mrs. Dunlop, look what I have for you. And it was a golf, uh, not a golf ball, a tennis ball that said Dunlop on <laughs> Aw, so sweet. <laughs> Any other uh, memories from when you were raising kids? So anything that stood out for you in terms of raising kids? Because then I'm going to ask you what led you from Southfield to Chelsea and then eventually to Silver Maples. Okay. Um, memories of raising kids. We lived in a neighborhood with lots of kids. Um, you know, the houses were all close together and we lived on a cul-de-sac. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 just regular old family life. I will say it's very different from at least what my experience is when I look around me now. We were, we were free range kids in that we, and, and every, most people were at that time, it was just different. This is in the, in the late 60s and in the 70s. Um, <laughs> Mom and Dad did not have like a tight rein on us. We girls, we would take off on our bikes and there were kids everywhere. We would, we would go and play with our friends and you know, we'd walk to school and back. And you know, as long as we were back in again when I think like maybe the street lights came on when it, before it got dark, um, it seems to me like we, we could have gotten in so much trouble. We didn't, I will, I will tell you that we didn't. We four girls, we, we were, as Dad would also say in later life, you girls were good and like well i don't remember you saying that before dad but he certainly said that when we were older and we did we had a wonderful childhood we had a woods right behind our house and we could go and play in the woods as much as we wanted and long well, we checked back in again at night but something that you and dad always made sure was that we were home for dinner we could go out and play again after dinner but you had to come home for dinner yeah there were very few good excuses for missing dinner yeah i hardly ever did anybody miss dinner and i we got in the habit of um, asking, like, what about school? Well, like a lot of parents do. Um, so we always had real good discussions at dinner time. Yeah. I always enjoyed that. And I always remember, too, sometimes the phone would ring during dinner, but we weren't allowed to answer it if the phone rang during dinner, unless you were waiting to hear if you got a part in a play. And if you were waiting to hear if you got a part in a play, mom and dad would let you go into the other room. The phone had a really, really long cord on it. And you would take you would pick up the phone and go way around the corner. And you'd either come back really happy or really sad. And either way, you'd be around loved ones, so it would be okay. Yeah, Southfield Schools had a wonderful drama um, group and wonderful drama teacher. She passed away not too long ago, but we all loved Mrs. Boards. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, and, and they were always in plays and such. They weren't so much into sports. Um, none of us were, but drama they were in. And I think what got them started was when you were real young, we bought you a recorder. Uh, you know, they're nowadays, Probably everybody has one of those, but in those days they didn't. And it was a, a thing where you could record your voice. And I think that's what got you guys started. At least it seemed to me. 
Okay. <laughs> not, not the big wave? That was I was going to say. Oh, yeah, we once did a film. Um, we once made a movie, a family movie. After church on Sunday, we um, sat, one of the girls, Debbie, who's not here, um, wrote a story about the, the cave, what was it? The caveman. About caveman, caveman yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And, um, Debbie was the child. Uh, no, Jennifer was the child. Well, Debbie was too. And Debbie, no, no, Debbie was the mom, and you were the dad. Anyway, <laughs> the story. Yes. The cool thing was was that everybody had their roles. So Laura helped with the costumes with mom, and and uh, we built a little volcano that that uh, we put in baking soda, and dad like. Um, red, dye. red dye, so it looked like it was a volcano erupting. Because it was supposed to be about the family, a family of cavemen that eventually the oh, lava came in and turned them into stone. Or as Debbie wrote it, they all got stoned. That was, <laughs> but she didn't realize what happened was we turned into stone. Um, but and then and then we 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 did the whole thing, the movie and. And it was so much, what a fun thing to do as a family. And so we in got one to, day. It was one the day. whole thing we did after yeah. church yeah. in one day. And then the best part was at, at the end when we did the credits, we did, all did the credits and then we had whipped cream in a plate and everybody got a pie of whipped cream in the face. And I, I'll still remember that to this day. It was such a fun family project, but that's the kind of upbringing that we had. It was just a, it was a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. childhood. Thanks to, to, to mom and dad. So at some point in time, you guys decided to leave Southfield. And I am going fast forward right now. So this is the kids are grown up and, mm -hmm. and left. We all have left the nest. And you and dad uh, were looking for a place to live. And I had already moved to Chelsea, so had Debbie. And we were really working hard to try to get you guys to move here. And we were super, super successful and happy that we did. Yeah. So you moved to the other side of Chelsea. And you lived there for how long? Um, well, this was after we had retired. We were living in a you know, four-bedroom house, much too big. And so we both retired in 2000 and um, had, a, well, no, moved yeah, to a brand new house. Um, it's actually Dexter Township, but the, what we did was of a, a, a radius around Chelsea, where two of our four daughters were living, um, we, that was how the houses that we looked at. And, um, you know, I knew they really wanted us to live close by. Well, hey, we wanted to live close by too. And we did, and besides that, Debbie raises chickens and she promised us free eggs for the rest of our lives. And she's been doing that yep. too, yep. And that mm -hmm. continues. Yes. But with mom and dad being in Chelsea, it meant they were all that much closer to a big chunk of their grandkids. So it won't surprise you that mom and dad were great um, mm -hmm. grandparents, uh, excellent grandparents, or now you're a great grandma, but um, Nana and Papa is what we call them. And they came to all the many events that have, um, what my daughter, my youngest daughter is here. She was in lots of different uh, shows and whatnot and, and Jenny's kids and in all of their shows and drum, you know, playing on the drum, uh, drum team, drum line, drum line. Um, so we got to have that too, which was such a blessing. Oh yeah, Chelsea schools, they do such a good job. Uh, you know, it was really great and lots and lots of things to do for the family. Yes. And now I'm gonna fast forward a little bit more. Um, Dad began to grow ill, and um, there was a, a good portion of time when um, Mom did such a beautiful job of taking care of Dad, and they were scheduled to move here to Silver Maples, and then when it was two, maybe two and a half weeks um, after they were here, Dad passed. Um, in fact, his memorial service was right here in this right very in this room, room, right yeah. in this very room. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have mom talk about how her life has changed in the year and a half or so that it's been since dad passed. Um, I will say one really cool thing um, to, to help convince dad to move to Silver Maples was there was a woman, I, what was her name again? 
Oh, Janet Leonard. She's not here today, but she's in our assisted living. Yeah. She is here. You are. Oh, Hi, Janet. I Janet. Didn't see you. Oh, okay. I'm so glad you're here. You got to hear this story. Let me tell yes. you the Janet Leonard story, okay? We had been trying to convince my father to move here. Years, years we had been trying to convince him. But you know, like, you know, no, it's hard to change and things like that. So mom, we were saying, well, why don't you just walk around? Like, you were pushing dad in the wheelchair at this point, mm -hmm. going around the Silver Maples Loop. And Janet was, was coming from the other way and stopped to chat a little bit with them. And she said to dad, I don't see very well, but I can tell you are a handsome man. <laughs> and that did it. And that did it. Dad decided then, this is where we gotta move, Rita. And we're like, Thank you, beautiful woman, whoever you are, who said Dad was handsome. And it was Janet right here. I will forever be grateful for that. So yeah, round of applause. Okay, so now my question for you is this, Mom. It's, it's been about a year and a half since Dad mm -hmm. passed. Tell me what your life has been like, how it's different, how you managed to cope, and, and, and uh, get, let us in on that. Okay, um, of course, our granddaughter, Emily, was working here prior to us moving in. And um, so we had our, she, urged us to put our name on the waiting list because it was long then too. Um, but um, yeah, my mind goes blank. No, it's not. so <laughs> yeah, so Emily was helpful in convincing yes. us to come here too. Yes. I agree. Yeah. So uh, we talked about the concept of when dad first passed, there were a couple ladies here. Oh, yes. Trottle, now you guys all know Trottle and Mary Ann. When you, when you move in here, you're kind of like assigned um, hospitality people. And they were, for me, um, oh, they were so helpful. As were my next door neighbor, we share a roof, Isla. And Jim and Ann, who live next door to me, um, I needed, I, I was, you know, we had just moved in, big change there, and then to lose my husband so soon after. But, oh my gosh, there are so many. I'm looking out and seeing a lot of you. So many wonderful people here. We are such a lucky group. Um, and just getting to know people's names and all, you kind of, and we had been married 63 years, and you kind of, when you've lost your special person, you kind of have to like reinvent yourself, you know? You, you almost become a different person. Um, How are you different now than you were a year and a half ago? I, I think I'm a little bit more outgoing, and maybe that's something all of you can relate to, too. Um, because it, it is so different than how life was before. It really is, and yet it isn't. Um, you, it, again, Silver Maples is people, and um, the, you guys made all the difference, and we have so many activities here. Um, you're all, you can be busy all the time if you want to. Um, I fortunately also was busy in the later years of living um, before moving here, and very active in adult learners, which is a group I love. Mort and I were on the board for many years, I still am. Um, the Garden Club and the Chelsea Garden Club, and now I belong to the Memorial Garden Club here, or committee. Um, but yeah, it, you bring some of your interests with you, but once you get here, 
there's so much offered for us. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me shortly after dad died and said, don't worry, we're gonna take good care of your mom. <laughs> And I'll tell you that that and it brought me such peace, and I'm, 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 I'll be forever, I'll be forever grateful to you, good people, for that. So, so thank you for that. Thanks for, for keeping keeping good care of my mom um, during during one of the toughest times of, of her life and, and ours as well. Mm -hmm. So, mom, one of the things I was really impressed is that shortly, not that long after you had been here, you had a chance to take a trip to Iceland. Yes. And you said yes, and your daughters were thrilled that you were brave enough to say yes. My aunt Sylvia and my cousin Kathy are experienced travelers, and so that gave us daughters <laughs> peace of mind. And Tiffany, I, and my godchild and, and cousin Tiffany, also very experienced traveler. Um, but what is a highlight? You were in Iceland really not that long before those volcanoes started exploding. So tell me really, about some, yeah. uh, some highlights of that trip to Iceland. Well, um, the very first thing we did when we got off the plane was go to a uh, hot water spring. I think that's what it's called. Um, Blue Lagoon, yes. Oh my gosh, to experience that. The water, it's, you know, like a... a very small lake or large pool, I don't know what you would call it, but it's warmed from the volcanoes that are close by. Um, and as Linda said, like two, maybe three weeks after we got home, one of those volcanoes erupted and the Blue Lagoon is not in surface anymore. They, they had to close down because of all the damage they had done. Um, but if if ever you get to go to Iceland, it's so different there. Um, the food is different, based around fish, lot, lots of it is. And some of it is a little bit too different. Um, <laughs> Didn't you have like some tomato ice cream or something? Oh yeah, a, t a, a tomato farm where it's all done hydroponically, growing tomatoes. And every and they served lunch there too, and everything on the menu was tomato based mm -hmm. um, soup, easy um, canopy, canopies is that what they're called? Yeah, those little sandwiches like and cheesecake. tomato cheesecake. Tomato oh, cheesecake. Tomato cheese. That's it was right. really good. It, it was. was it was really delicious. Good. Yes, <laughs> yes, but just. It was a little strange too, but interesting, really interesting. But there was some fish that was marinated for a long time that we ate at another place. Shark, um, shark. Shark, shark, and it was marinated in something strange, but I can't remember what it was. I want to say ammonia. Would they do that? Oh, that's, no, that's, that's the byproduct. Oh, that's the that's byproduct. Okay, okay, okay. I got that. That's Not right. marinated in ammonia. <laughs> Unique and wonderful. All right. Yes. So speaking of unique and wonderful, you have how many grandchildren? <laughs> eleven. No, I knew. I just couldn't remember. Okay, insane. eleven. I have eleven grandchildren, and, how many and grandchildren? I have five great grandchildren. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We will all be going on vacation together very soon. Yep. It's something we do every other year and have for many years. We go to a resort, and um, the one we're going to this year is Fountain Point, and it's near Traverse City. A um, lot of little cottages, um, and it's great because the great grandkids will be there too. Yes. Yeah. And we have many, many family traditions in that we have tournaments that we all play, and we all go our separate ways, but come back together in the afternoon to play Foursquare. Young and old will play Foursquare. I still remember, I mean, Dad was right in on the Foursquare. Oh, and yeah. He, and so yeah. all the way from Papa down to some of the, to Dennis, one of the youngest, uh, grand, the youngest grandchildren, playing Foursquare together. And then we have something called Aunt Debbie Games, 
where my sister Deb has really fun you know, relay type games that we all so team up and yeah. play mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And then we have drink of the day, where each family takes a turn making some sort of fun drink. Mom and Dad had a reputation of making the strongest <laughs> drinks ever. And as somebody who does not drink very often, I remember that after that, then we had to walk to dinner. And Jenny, you can attest to this. After mom and dad had drink of the day, it would be a little wibbly wobbly walking <laughs> to dinner because, oh my goodness. But then we all have dinner together, just like in the olden days. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful family time. I think the cousins are so close today. Your grandkids are so close today because growing up, I mean, we started this when they were just little kids and they got to grow up together in this. And yeah, that was the intention. I, you know, I grew up with being very close to my cousins, and I always thought that was really interesting. And important, I mean, not interesting. That too. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Mom. If your grandchildren were all sitting in front of you, and the great-grandchildren too, and they were all here, and one of them said, Nana, tell us what is your philosophy on life, or oh, what's right. a way to enjoy life as much as possible. What's your what's your advice? Wow. What would you say to them? I'd have to give it some thought. Um, I think to always lead with kindness, um, that'll never get you into trouble. Um, well, it shouldn't get you into trouble. Um, yeah, um, and, and stay close. Close. Amen. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Rita Dunlop. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you all for coming today. I'm, I, I knew I was going to have some family members here, but it's wonderful to look out there and see you all. I, I appreciate so much your coming. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Rita? We have just a teensy bit more extra time. So does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask mom? Yes. Okay, so the question was, what language did your folks speak? Okay, they spoke Maltese. In fact, um, when we, when they were having the children and when we were there at home, they all spoke Maltese, my older brothers and sisters and I. And when my oldest brother started kindergarten, um, he didn't have a good, you know, he, he wasn't real familiar with English. And um, so the, they called my parents into the school and told them that they should start concentrating on speaking English, that it would make it easier on us kids starting. Um, so because of that, my older sisters and brothers could, could you know, understand Maltese pretty well. I can understand it, I can't speak it well. I know, you know, like, oh, swear words <laughs> really, you know, can you can I, you just like count to nine in Mal so they get a feel for the the i'll take the microphone over to aunt mary then in just a second <laughs> i want you guys to get a feel for what maltese sounds like because it's it sounds closer to like arabic than to say italian or spanish it really it's it, to me anyway I think, yeah. so aunt mary if i came over to you with the microphone would you be able to count to ten in maltese i might be able to okay or aunt sylvia no, no so it's Sylvia's one of the youngest, so again, yeah. she was all English by the time she came through. Or can you say any phrase in Maltese so they can get a feel for it? Kip in tea. Okay. Kip that's how tea. are you? That's how are you? Okay, now count is Wihit Tanain Tlita, Erba Hamza Sitta, Seba Timinya Disa Ashra. Give her a hand. Good job, Mary. Well done. And Mary's over 90. That's pretty cool to, 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 to come out with that. So you see, it did, it's, it's got a very sort of Arabic sort of sound to it. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for Mom? Yes. Rita, you mentioned that you met this young lady at the end of the row over here on the Silver Maple Blue. Jim. Did you prearrange that so that she could <laughs> Not at all, Jim. She, um, 
was just coming, she was coming in the opposite direction. I'm pushing more in the wheelchair. And I, I don't remember what started us talking, but nope, that was, that was just Janet. She's such a sweetheart. <laughs> Peg's got a question. Yes, Peg. Rita, you are a special person because of your personality that you're making a way here. You are always smiling. You always have a nice word. And even when there was problems in the family, you had a sunny smile. And oh, wait, I want to give her the mic for this. <laughs> you were great to know right from the beginning, and we love having you here. So I'm so I was really pleased when I saw that your name was going to be on it because you deserve it. The way you've come in through all of your difficulties and still made your way in, into our hearts. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Okay. My sister Sylvia. That's your name, right? No, you're Sylvia. <laughs> you're Rita. <I'm> yes. <laughs> they're a, they were the love of life. We got along very well, yes. even though there were ten of us. We got along very well. Which Dad insisted on. The <laughs> <laughs> love of your lives. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anybody else? Any other questions? All right. Thank you again for being here. Yes, and thank, thank you. you. See you at the next Silver Majors People. And thank you, Grace. And thank you, BBZ. And I love you, Mom. <laughs>